You'll have to uh, forgive me if the lecture set gets too academic or if I begin to sermonize. The problem is that I give sermons in our local community in Lethbridge, and I also present academic papers, and then I teach at the university. And my fear is that sometimes when I'm giving the sermon, it sounds too academic, or that if I'm teaching at the university, it sounds like a sermon. <laughs> or if I'm at an academic conference, that I sound like I'm addressing the interfaith community, because each group has its premises and presuppositions. So if you see a bit of a mixture of that, please forgive me. There's a, um, I might, I might be, there might be different masks that I'll be putting on in the course of this presentation. Now, initially I was supposed to speak about uh, archetypes of uh, female spirituality in early, Suf in early Islam. I was going to speak about three seminal figures from the early history of Islam. Khadija, uh, the wife of the Prophet of Islam, Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, and Rabia, this early mystic from the 8th century. And what happened was that when I started looking into the lives of each of these three prominent women, I realized there was enough of a lecture, for there was enough material for an independent lecture on each three of them. So I decided just to stick with Rabia, whom I had uh, begun to gather material on. And uh, I ran the idea by uh, Shiv, if he was okay with me just presenting on Rabia, and he said he was fine with that. So, so um, and Rabia is certainly the, 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 the most well-known of the three. Now, Rabia is known <coughs> as uh, Rabia al-Adawiyah, also as Rabia al-Basri. She's one of the most important figures to emerge out of early Islamic history, particularly in the history of Islamic piety, spirituality, and mysticism. She's a very prominent figure. She's well known throughout the Islamic world. Her fame rests on the manner in which she came to embody what has been described as the pure love of God, a love that is attested to by many of her sayings and aphorisms, as well as the stories that have been recounted about her by tradition. Rabia is also not entirely unknown in the West. Bishop Jean-Pierre Camot, I can pronounce French better than I can speak it, by the way. So I take delight in pronouncing French words even though I can't really understand the language. <laughs> Bishop Jean-Pierre Camon, um, in the 17th century, he wrote a book called On True Charity, which was a 700-page study of Rabia. And in this book, he confessed, confessed of his great admiration for Rabia. He said, and I quote, he said, I found in her a master more faithful in the science of saints and in the doctrine of salvation than any other source ever presented to me after the Holy Scripture. And this was quite a statement for an official of the Catholic Church to make because what he was essentially saying that the greatest model of spiritual perfection outside of the Bible itself was to be found in this 8th century female Muslim mystic. What attracted the French bishop most to Rabbi was her doctrine of love, her doctrine of the pure love of God, or of the undiluted love of God. A doctrine which he contrasted with the mercenary expectations of those who preferred God's paradise to the God of paradise. A theme to which I'll return at the very end of this lecture. Now, before I speak about Rabia, I should begin by noting that Rabia's life is steeped in legend. It really lies stranded in between myth and history, or between what academic scholars sometimes refer to as biography and hagiography. A biography is a historical account of a figure. A hagiographical account is an account of a pious author who might embellish the story for the purposes of inspiring the reader. And so when we come to the figure of Rabbi, we find that um, Rabia's life story is stranded in between myth and history, between biography and hagiography. So much so that it's well nigh impossible to construct a factually accurate account of the life of Rabia. Any construction of her life is therefore spec speculative in nature due to the meagerness of reliable historical sources. All we know about Rabia, as I noted, um, are sayings and aphorisms about her, as well as stories about her recounted in early medieval sources. And because many of these uh, stories involve 
meetings with people that she probably could not have met from a purely historical point of view, or far-fetched miraculous events that seem to reflect more the creative imagination of the hagiographer than anything else, we have to take these stories with a certain grain of salt. But even though the historical accuracy of these stories as factual events may be suspect, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're not true. In other words, that just because something is not factual does not mean it is not true, because the truth of a story might lie more in its moral value than its, than its actual facticity. It may have a truth value that is more important than whether or not the actual event occurred. There are moral lessons contained in stories that are attributed to historical figures which might not have occurred in precisely the form that they've been transmitted, but which are nevertheless repositories of wisdom. Just as there are events that we know of with great detail that are completely irrelevant to us existentially. There are events that we are aware of historically that are completely is existentially irrelevant. And there are other events which are purported to have occurred which have profound meaning for us. And so a story might be true even though it's not true, depending on how I understand the nature of truth. Now with that said, even though, as I know, that Rabia's life is steeped in legend, this does not mean that the accounts of her life are entirely fictitious. So I do want to qualify what I said earlier. There is enough consistency within the stories that we have about Rabia, found in different writers, to confirm the general contours of her life. One such attempt to reconstruct Rabia's life on the basis of the early sources was attempted by the Syrian, the late Syrian Lebanese writer by the name of Wideh de Sikaki in a book that was published originally in the 1950s in Arabic and which was then translated in the early 80s and published as first among Sufis. Uh, Wideh de Sikaki was a well-known Syrian Lebanese Le Lebanese Syrian novelist uh, who wrote between the 50s and the early 80s. What, Ra what Wideh de Sikaki did was that she used the source material the medieval source material to construct as best as she could the details of Rabia's life, even though her own work was marked by a certain degree of speculation, which she, later, which she herself confessed. And I've heavily relied on this work for today's lecture. To Wideh the Sekakina's work, we should also add another study that came out many years ago by the British Orientalist Margaret Smith called Rabia the Mystic and Our Fellow Saints in Islam. There's also a forthcoming study of Rabia uh, by a professor at Emory University by the name of Rukhaya Cornell, who will be coming up with the most updated study and account of the life of Rabia. Now, as far as the medieval source material is concerned, one of the most <coughs> extensive accounts of Rabia is to be found um, in a book called The Memorial of the Saints by Attar, a medieval Persian Sufi poet whose name you might have heard of because he's the author of the well-known book, The Conference of the Birds, which is an epic Sufi poem translated into English many times. The same author uh, wrote a book called The Tathkarat al or The Memorial of the Saints, which is a hagiographical account of the lives of the early saints. Now, I mentioned <coughs> that her name is Rabia al-Basri. Rabia al-Basri simply means Rabia of Basra or Rabia the Basra, because Rabia was the city of Basra in modern day Iraq. Now most of you are familiar with the name Basra. I imagine if you read the news, because Basra has been in the news ever since the recent war in Iraq. Um, it's, it's been all over the news. So most people are familiar with the name of Basra in Fallujah. It was in the news because it was found that the cancer rates in the regions of Fallujah and Basra were higher than they were in Japan after World War II. And that's how high the cancer rates were because of the, the bombing of the region. Um, and so that's why it's been in the news. In the medieval past, however, the pre-modern past, the city was known as a major metropolitan center. It was a major uh, cultural, intellectual, uh, and religious uh, center in the region of the Near East. The city was sometimes referred to as the Venice of the East. The reason it was referred to as the Venice of the East was because it, has a, it had a series of interlocking canals which ran through the city, much like Venice. And so just as in Venice, how you can move from one part of the city to another on a canal, 
because of the interlocking canals that connect the city. Similarly, Basra as a port city had a series of interlocking canals that could allow you to go from one part of the city to another. And so it was known as the Venice of the East. The city itself um, was built in the 7th century uh, under the rule of a man by the name of Omar the Conqueror, who, who was the second political successor of Muhammad. He was the second caliph after, to emerge after the death of Muhammad. And it was under his rule that the city was built on the site of an, of an old Persian settlement, a settlement of the Persian Empire. The city was almost built from scratch. The city derives its name because of the color of the soil. The soil of the region is black, and Basra, according to some accounts, means black soil. So the city is named because of the color of the soil of the region. Now, not long after Basra was developed in the 7th century, it became home to a large heterogeneous community, a mixed ethnic, cultural, and religious community made up of Arabs and non-Arabs, Muslim and non-Muslims. The non-Arabs were mostly of Persian, Malay, and Indian extraction who had immigrated to the region. And the non-Muslims were mostly of Jewish, Christian, and Zoroastrian and black. So the city was ethnically and religiously diverse. And this diversity of the city allowed it to become a cultural capital of the region in the 7th century. So much so that the city actually reached its zenith in the 8th century, not long after it was built. In the words of Louis Messiaen, who was a, a famous scholar of early Sufism, Basra, in fact, is the veritable crucible in which Islamic culture assumed its form, crystallized in the classical mold between the 1st and the 4th centuries. So Basra was a very important city as far as the development of classical or medieval Islamic culture was concerned. Now, what do we know about Rabia herself? Well, Rabia, as far as the medieval sources are concerned, was born into an extremely impoverished family in um, the 8th century. According to some accounts, she was born around 17, 715 CE. She was born in, in an extremely impoverished family in what we would consider today to be the slums of the city, in the slums of Basra. According to Attar, the author of the Memorial of the Saints, when Rabi was born, the family was so poor that they didn't even have oil to light a lamp in the city, in the, in the home. And so Rabia's mother, in her desperation, sent the father to the next door neighbor's house to ask for some oil. Now the father, however, was a deeply pious man, extremely scrupulous, and had made a vow to God that he would not ask anyone for anything despite his poverty. And so he went to the neighbor's house, put his hand on the door of the neighbor's house, and came back, told the wife that no one had any oil to give. That night, he fell asleep, and he had a dream, according to Attab, where the Prophet Muhammad appears to him and says to him that, do not grieve. The child that is born will become a queen among women, and she will be the means for the salvation of 70,000 people. And the Prophet also gives him instructions on how he can go about finding sustenance for the family. Now the sources, the medieval sources, also tell us that um, from very early on, Rabia distinguished herself for her scrupulousness, her scrupulous piety, and her deep consciousness of God. The sources also tell us that um, Rabia was orphaned at a very young age. She grew up as an orphan. When her parents died, they left behind a number of children. Rabia was the fourth of them, by the way, which is why she's called Rabia. Rabia literally, literally means the fourth. And that's why she's called Rabia. I gave a sermon on Rabia, and one fellow came up to me and said, you know, my aunt's name is Rabia, but she's the third child, so why would that be? And I said, she's probably named after Rabia, a bus <laughs> Now, Rabia, as I said, was orphaned as a, as a young child. She was, there were a number of sisters that were also orphaned with her. Not long after the parents died, a severe famine struck the city of Basra, so that the once blossoming city experienced a breakdown of social order. The poor were the ones that were most adversely affected in this breakdown of social order. So much so that Rabia's sisters um, became scattered in their search for scraps of food and eventually lost contact with each other. All the children lost contact 
in the, law, in the lawlessness which unfolded as a result of this famine and the subsequent breakdown of social order, Rabia was herself captured and sold as a slave. And so began Rabia's early years as a young woman. She began as a slave. Now, tradition also states that Rabia's slave owner was a rather harsh man who used to burden Rabia with a number of taxing chores and responsibilities that were beyond her capacity to fulfill. Her trust in God, for which she became famous in later years, seemed to have reached the limit one day when she broke her arm. In her desperation, she cried out to God in prayer. She says, Lord God, I am a stranger, orphaned of both mother and father, a helpless prisoner who has fallen into captivity with a broken hand. And yet for all of this, I do not grieve all I need is your pleasure. All I need is your acceptance. She then heard a divine voice address her. Do not grieve, O Rabia. Tomorrow a rank will be yours, so that even the angels will envy you. Now tradition has it that the slave master noticed Rabia's piety. And he also recognized that there was something extremely special about Rabia. In the hagiographical accounts, the reason that's given is because there were certain miracles that she was said to have been able to perform. So the slave master recognized that there was something special about Rabia, and so freed Rabia. When Rabia, became, when Rabia was given her freedom, we're not certain exactly what happened following her freedom. According to some accounts, she went to Mecca to perform the pilgrimage. According to other accounts, she remained in Basra. What we can be more or less certain of, however, is that Rabia began to associate with the ascetics of Basra. The ascetics were men and women who devoted themselves to God to, through long periods of prayer, fasting, night vigils, and renouncing the pleasures of the flesh. They were known for their other worldliness. They also directed all of their energies towards death and preparing for the impending encounter with God. Among the ascetics, there was also a group of people known as the weepers because they used to weep for their sins uh, in a state of repentance. There was a book of poetry published some years ago called Weeping Sufi, Laughing Buddha. And the author was drawing on these, the name was drawn from these early Sufis who were known as the weepers. Now, Rabia kept the company of these ascetics. She attended their circles, she discussed religious and spiritual matters with them, and was completely steeped in their world. So much so that it colored her own form of spirituality and religiosity, particularly during the earlier phases of her spiritual development. It was due to this association with the ascetics, as well as her own desire to emulate the asceticism of Muhammad. Because there is, after all, a famous saying of Muhammad or a hadith where he said, Fakhri Fakhri, my poverty, my pride lies in my poverty. It was partly out of her desire to emulate the example of the ascetics, as well as the asceticism of Muhammad, that Rabia herself developed a reputation for her own austerity, for her detachment from the things of this world. She saw the objects of the world, um, or the objects of human desire and covetousness, as veils which separated the human being from God. And so she developed this reputation for austerity. It is said that Rabbi used to wear a patched mantle, worn out sandals, and a, she used to carry around a broken stick. So that when people saw her, they thought that she was an aimless wanderer. According to one account, her only possession besides the broken down hut that she used to live in was a hook in the hut where she used to hang her shroud to remind her of death. Because in traditional Islamic burial rites, the deceased are enshrouded in a cloth and buried. Her otherworldliness is also reflected in a number of stories that we have about Rabia. In one of these stories, Rabia once gave a man four dinars, and she asked him to purchase for her a blanket. The man then asks her, shall it be black or white? She takes back the money and throws it in the Tigris River. She says, must it be black or white? Because of an unpurchased blanket, duality has come into the world. <laughs> because of an unpurchased blanket, duality has come into the world. The illusion was how even the slightest of worldly concerns cast the soul away from its contemplation of one into the domain of multiplicity. And later, Sufi theoreticians and philosophers saw in this an allusion to the doctrine of the unity of being, or 
non-duality, which finds its equivalent in the, the Hindu doctrine of the Vedanta. Now, because of her otherworldliness, Rabia had also developed a reputation for refusing gifts, especially uh, generous gifts, despite the best intentions of the benefactor or the gift giver. God is sufficient for me, she would often say. One time, Sofiana Thauri, a very important juridical authority from the early history of Islam, and also an ascetic and something of a mystic in his own right, he came to Rabia's hut, and he found in front of her hut a merchant standing glum-faced with a bag of gold coins in his hand. He asked the merchant, why are you standing here so despondent? And he, the merchant says to him that I brought a sack of gold coins for Rabia to help her in her poverty. But I'm afraid that she won't accept it. So they both walked in. Sofyan presents the bag of gold coins to Rabia. Rabia looks at the coins and she begins to weep. She says, I'm ashamed to ask of the things of this world from its owner, by which she meant God. How then can I accept this from someone who doesn't know it? And this was her doctrine of complete reliance on God. Another, on another occasion, Malik bin Dinar, a very famous Sufi from the early history of Islam, he found Rabia sitting on a straw mat, drinking from a broken jug. He says to Rabia, oh Rabia, I have many wealthy friends. If you would please allow me to ask them to give you something, they would be more than willing to do so. She says to Malik, she says, Malik, this is not the way to talk. God provides for me just as he provides for them. Just the one who remembers, does the one who remembers to provide for the rich forget to provide for the poor? What she was trying to teach him was this doctrine of trust in God, having complete trust in God, that God does not neglect the impoverished any more than he remembers those who are in a state of material prosperity. On yet another occasion, a merchant insisted that she accept a home as a gift because she used to live in this broken down hut in the slums of Basra. Rabia acquiesced under pressure, but not long afterwards she gave it back. She returned it. When asked why, she said that she began to marvel one day at the beauty of the home and then was realized or became afraid that it would cut her off from the contemplation of God. And so she gave it back. And there are many stories of Rabia in the hagiographical and the biographical accounts of this fear that she had of being cut off from her single-minded devotion to God, this contemplation of God. And we have many paradoxical sayings of her as well. One time, she invited some people over to her home, and she began to tear the morsels of meat with her teeth. They said to Rabia, oh Rabia, do you not, do you not have a knife? She says, I've never kept a knife in my house for fear of being cut off. And when she meant cut off from God. We have these paradoxical sayings of Rabia. Now in all of these accounts, it should be clarified that Rabia's asceticism was not rooted in an asceticism for its own sake, let alone as a means of punishing the soul. There were ascetics in the early history of Islam, just as there have been ascetics in the history of worlds, the, the religions of the world, who have adopted asceticism precisely as a means of self-laceration, of punishing the body, of a, as a form of penitence. This was not the case with Rabia. For Rabia, it simply had to do with finding in God all that she sought. It had very little to do with any kind of contempt for the world. In fact, Rabia was rather critical of those who made public displays of their contempt for the world, because she felt that it reflected a hidden desire for it. One time, a religious dignitary came to Rabia's hut and began to speak with contempt about the world. He said, the world is this, and the world is that, and worldly people are like this, and worldly people are like that. Rabia says to the man, you love the world dearly. The man was shocked and somewhat embarrassed. He said, well, what do you mean? She says, if you didn't, you wouldn't remember it so much. After all, it is the buyer who disparages the goods. It is the buyer who disparages the goods. If you were free of the world, you would neither remember it for good or evil. Because a person remembers what they love. A person remembers what they love. So what she was trying to impress upon this man was that his obsession with the evils of the world in truth revealed a kind of covetousness for the world. That if he was truly preoccupied with God, 
that he would have no, no reason to berate the world, just as he would have no reason to speak well of the world. He would be indifferent to the world. This attitude of Rabia's was perhaps best reflected in a prayer that she would frequently recite. The prayer was, O oh Lord, give my portion of the world to your enemies, and give my portion of the next world, namely heaven, to your friends. You are enough for me. Give my portion of this world to your enemies, and give my portion of the next world to your friends, because you are enough for me. In her life, one finds, therefore, a living example of the teachings of Christ, that we do not live on bread alone. Because what Rabbi found through the inner life was a richness that she could not find in the outer life. She found in a life of contemplation, in a life of interiority, in a life of inwardness and prayer, which she could not find in any other kind of life. It is like the story of the time, it is like the time that one of Rabia's servant girls came to Rabia on a morning spring day. She comes to Rabia's door, she says to Rabia, Oh Rabia, come outside and look at the beauty of creation. Rabia says to her, Rather come within and look at the beauty of the Creator. The contemplation of God has turned me away or preoccupied me from gazing at anything other than God. In other words, why should one be preoccupied with contemplating the beauty of God in his reflections when one can contemplate God directly through the inner life, through the, through the inward life, prayer and meditation? Now, one of the most interesting features that we notice in many of the accounts of Rabia is of her open, even intimate interactions with men. This is one of the features to stand out in many of the stories, the accounts that we have from Rabia. These intimate, open interactions with men. Now one might think that in a medieval setting, such as Basra, in the regions of modern day Iraq, that the genders would have been segregated in all domains. But we certainly don't get this impression when we read the accounts of Rabia's life. What the stories seem to reveal is that there was a fairly open degree of interaction between men and women within ascetic and mystical circles in Rabia's time. In the case of Rabia, it is very clear that she had very close ties with many of the men of her time in a spirit of spiritual companionship. Sufyan Thori, the juridical figure who's name I mentioned earlier, who comes to Rabia's door and offers her the bag of gold. Sofiana Anathori, an eminent religious figure, once said that, and I quote, I was with Rabia one night, and we prayed together until daybreak. In the morning she said to me, we ought to fast this day in thankfulness, in thankfulness to God for the prayers that he allowed us to do. In other words, the two of them spent the entire night in prayer together. And in the morning, Rabia says to her, we should thank God by fasting because of the opportunity that he gave us to pray. There's another story of a leading religious authority, Hassan al-Basri, according to Attal, who spent the entire night in the company of Rabia discussing the mysteries of the spiritual life. The next morning he said that the entire night the thought that I am a man and she is a woman never crossed my mind. That's why he said, the entire night the thought that I am a man and she is a woman never crossed my mind. What these anecdotes reveal is that such ex exchanges between the gen genders were acceptable within the cultural milieu of the time, especially within the ascetic and the mystical circles, so long as they were not motivated by anything other than purely spiritual intentions. If the intentions were purely spiritual, then it was acceptable within the ascetic and mystical circles for men and women to openly interact with each other. However, one thing we also learn from these interactions with men is that Rabia, if Rabia ever felt that a man took a personal interest in her, that she would quickly rebuff him. In fact, Rabia became quite famous in later history for the wit and the creativity and the humor with which she would often refuse suitors who came to her proposing marriage. There are many, many numerous accounts of what Rabia's witty rejections of the men who come to her asking for her man for her hand in marriage. This is a recurring theme in the anecdotes. In one particular anecdote, there's a story of a, the story is told, of a prince from Basra, uh, a man from the royal family in Basra, uh, 
who asked uh, his companions in the royal court, who the most one, who, who is the most, who is the worthiest woman to marry? And they all were unanimous that it is Rabia of Basra. So the prince goes and presents himself to Rabia himself, and he says to her, and this, by the way, was the wrong proposal. He says, Rabia, I make 10,000 dinars a month. My monthly salary is that of 10,000 dinars. If you accept my hand in marriage, then I will make it yours. Rabia says to him that she senses the egotism in the proposal. And she says that you would be much better off if you distributed the money to the poor. Rather, you should fast from this world and make death the opening of your fast. Farewell. <laughs> Very abrupt confusion. Another story is told in Attar of a religious dignitary who came to Rabia, a man of great spiritual and ascetic standing, or great standing within the spiritual and the ascetic community. He comes to Rabia and he says to Rabia, would you like to take a husband? Which is an indirect way of referring to himself. He says, would you like to take a husband? Rabia says to him, the marriage knot can only tie one who exists. Where is existence here? I am not my own. You must ask him. In other words, she had transcended existence to such an extent that she could, be not, she could not be tied down or bound to marriage in a, to anyone. A kind of elliptical response. What does she mean? The marriage knot can only tie someone who exists. Where is existence here? She had transcended existence, attained some kind of degree of enlightenment, and she couldn't be tied down to anything other than God. The man was overtaken by her response. He asked her, by what means did you attain this degree? And Rabia says, by losing in him all that I had attained. By losing in him and all, that, all that I had attained. In other words, she had completely emptied her soul of everything other than God, so that it was filled with the light of Gnosis and the light of enlightenment. Rabia, the man then says to Rabia, even more impressed, Oh Rabia, please do tell me how it is that you have come to know God. And Rabia then says to him, You know the how, we know the know-how, and o how Very elliptical way of responding to the man, but nevertheless, you can see why this became, this became the subject of lengthy exegesis in the Hebrew tradition. You know the how, we know the know-how. Now, one of the most recurring of themes to stand out in these stories of Rabia is of how she would often put men in their places. Often religious dignitaries, even men of great religious standing, and these men would admire her even more for this. And so this is also a recurrent theme. In this respect, Rabia's sayings form part of a genre in Sufi literature where a saint might act as something of a gadfly, provoking his listener or her listener to come to a greater knowledge of their own shortcoming and thereby a greater knowledge of truth. This is a recurrent theme where the saint utters a word of truth that's hard for the listener, but helps awaken a, high, a greater degree of enlightenment and knowledge in the listener. And there are many such stories of this kind. We have, for example, the story of the, the, the saint who once said to the man who was leading the prayer in the congregation, the God that you worship lies beneath your feet. The community is aghast. What kind of blasphemous talk is this? The God that you worship lies beneath your feet. Later, they found a treasure buried underneath the spot where the man would pray meaning he was just a slave of wealth. We have another account of Nuri, this early Sufi, who once heard the Muazzin who makes the call to prayer, shouting out at the top of his lungs, God is great, God is great. Rumi says, kill and stab the man. And then he hears a dog barking, to which he responds, la baik, la baik, here I am my lord, at your service, here I am my lord, which is what the pilgrims recite when they go to Mecca. So he says to the Muazzin, to the people who hear the Muazzin, kill and stab the man, and he says to the dog, here I am, my lord, at your service. There's quite a commotion that's created. He's finally brought to the court of the caliph, and he's asked to explain his words, and he said that the Muazzin was simply making the call to prayer for his paycheck, whereas the dog was praising God the only way that it knows how to. <laughs> because there's a verse in the Quran that says, everything that is in the heavens and the earth praises God, but you do not understand their praise. So the dog was engaged in the prayer while the Muslim was just looking for his paycheck. So we have many of these stories in Sufi literature where the saint acts as something of a gadfly to provoke the listener to come to a greater knowledge of their own shortcoming. 
of truth. So we have such stories of Rabia. There's a story at one time of Sofiana Tholi, who makes his way into Rabia's company in the presence of some other men, and he prays out loud. He says, may God be well pleased with us, or oh God be well pleased with us. Rabia says to him in front of everyone else, you should be ashamed to ask God for his good pleasure, when you yourself are not well pleased with God. They ask Rabia, explain your words, O Rabia. When is a man well pleased with God? She says, when his joy in tribulation is the same as his joy in blessing. Only then is a man truly content and well pleased with God, because it is all the same. Everything is coming from the same source. Everything lies in the hands and the power of God. There's a wisdom, a providential wisdom behind everything. And one is so detached from the fluctuations of life that they're all the same. On another occasion, the Rabia asked a group of men to explain the meaning of generosity. One of the men gets up and says, generosity in the eyes of worldly people is generosity with one's wealth. Whereas generosity in the eyes of the people of the next world is generosity with themselves. They're generous with themselves. Rabia says this is a good answer, but not good enough. She says that the highest form of generosity is adoring God without even a thought for return. In other words, that even those who are generous with themselves might want something in return. But she says that the highest form of generosity is when you do not want even anything in return. There's no thought of return. There's another story told of Rabia where Rabia once saw a man running around the streets with a bandage around his head. She says to the man, she says, young man, how old are you? The man says, I'm 30 years old. And then she says to the man, for the greater part of your life, have you been healthy or sick? The man says, I've been healthy. <clears throat> so she, then, she, then she says to the man, she says, for 30 years, you've never run around the city with a bandage of gratitude tied around your head. But now, because of one measly headache, you're running around the city with a bandage of complaint, announcing to the whole world all of your problems. <laughs> right, so these are the kinds of stories that we find in life. Frequently of putting men of power in their place. Now, another theme that we encounter in these stories is that, or another feature of these stories, is that Rabia was frequently very kind and gentle with sinners. She could be harsh with religious dignitaries and men of power, even if they were men of great standing in the ascetic and the mystical communities. But she had a softness for sinners. One time Rabia was praying in her home and a thief came in while she was praying in the hut. And the thief, didn't, finding nothing, began to leave. Rabia says to the man, if you are to remain true to your vocation of thievery, you should not leave empty-handed. <laughs> the man says, but I couldn't find anything. Rabia says, well, come here. Take the jug from my hand. Perform the ablution, the ritual ablution, and go in the corner and pray two cycles of prayer. Go into the prayer area and perform two cycles of prayer. This way you won't leave empty-handed. The man says, very well, that's a good idea. So he takes the jug, he performs the ablution, and he goes to the corner and begins to pray, so he doesn't leave empty-handed. Then Rabia makes a prayer to God. She says, oh God, this man came to my door and I had to send him away empty-handed. I have now sent him to your door. Do not send him away empty-handed. <laughs> now she makes that prayer. The next morning, when she gets up, she sees the man is still performing a prayer in the corner. She asks the man, what happened? He said, that night, when I began to perform the prayer, a sweetness overcame my heart during the prayer. I found sweetness in the prayer. So much so that I couldn't leave the prayer. I spent the whole night in prayer, and now I vowed to give up my thievery and my evil ways and give myself to God. And so these are the kinds of stories we have in Rabbi. Harsh, with religious dignitaries, with men of power, but extremely kind with sinners, and, and so on. Now, what Rabia uh, is most famous for in the history of Islamic piety, however, lies in her teachings regarding the pure love of God. And it is fitting, therefore, to end with some remarks about her doctrine of love. It was in Rabia's teachings of love that we find, to return to the words of Bishop Jean-Pierre Camon, a view which is to be contrasted with the mercenary expectations of those who prefer God's paradise to the God paradise.
a view which is to be contrasted with the, relation, the business transactional relationship that many people set up with God. That if you give me X, I'll give you Y. If you give me B, I'll give you C. And this is what Bishop Jean-Pierre Camus took umbrage with in the communities of his time. That believers sometimes end up developing a kind of business transactional relationship with God. And he spoke of this, he said that such people are mercenaries in truth because they prefer God's paradise to the God of paradise. And so we have many, of, uh, many stories about Rabbi in which this doctrine of love is found. A group of important people once came to Rabbi. She asked them, why do you worship God? One of them said, I am fearful of the seven levels of hell. Another said, I am desirous of the degrees of paradise. Rabbi then says to them, to both of them, as well as to the company that they were in, it is indeed a weak soul that worships God out of fear or desire. Well, why then do you adore God, Rabbi? they asked. Do you not have any fears or desires? Rabbi responds by saying, first the neighbor, then the house. If there were no heaven or hell, would there be no reason to adore him? What she meant that God should be adored for no other reason than simply love. By first the neighbor, then the house, ajar thumbadar. What she meant was precisely what Bishop Jean Pierre had in mind when he spoke of the mercenary nature or the mercenary expectations of those who preferred God's paradise to the God of paradise. This is what he had in mind. Now, this doctrine of love is also found in a prayer of Rabia's, where she would pray to God. She would say, O oh Lord, if I worship you out of fear of hell, burn me in hell. And if I worship you out of a desire for paradise, cut me off from paradise. But if I, adore, if I adore you for your own sake, do not deprive me of your eternal beauty. This teaching of Rabia is perhaps found most famously in the story of Rabia, where she was once seen running through the streets of Basra with a torch in one hand and the bucket of water in the other. And they said to oh, they said to Rabia, Oh Rabia, where go with thou? With the torch in the bucket. And she said, With the bucket I wish to douse the flames of hell, and with the torch I wish to burn paradise to the ground. So that people will adore God for all, for no other reason than out of a pure and undiluted love of God. And this is what Rabia has come to be known to in a project. Thank you very much. One more time. Let's hear from her. Wow. Thank you so much, Atif. And, and I'll be able. Um, questions, folks? Question? Okay. To me, that seems a very glamorous picture of Ra Rabia. You're very perceptive. You're very perceptive because <laughs> no, I couldn't find any from? pictures of Rabia <laughs> under a Google image search. <laughs> So I thought I, 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 would try, I would find pictures that I could pass off as pictures of God. And as someone as as yourself would notice that these clothes are much too colorful for an ascetic such as Rabia to be wearing. That's right. So I'm very perceptive. And the other picture as well. That's right. Yes. Much too yes. glamorous. That's right. Very to be glamorous. Rabia. Yeah. This might be close. Okay. <laughs> Stephen, um, any comparisons to the life of Siddhartha, either Herman Hesse or otherwise, uh, in terms of um, uh, renunciation, uh, giving up royalty? Um, Stephen, can, can I get you to up just here with yeah. the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. Or you could repeat it. Yeah. Uh, uh, any comparison yeah, go, go, go. to the life of Siddhartha in terms of a renouncing a life of royalty? The comparison in that case has to be made not with Rabia, because Rabia was born in an impoverished home, but with another very important figure in early Sufism who's often been compared to the Buddha, a figure by the name of Ibrahim bin Adha, who is actually a prince in Bal, in the regions of modern day Afghanistan, and uh, was immersed in the life of luxury and experienced a certain kind of 
in life and decided to leave uh, the, the world. But what they have in common is this, I think, this, this uh, move towards asceticism. They renounce a worldly life and move towards asceticism, but then they don't end with asceticism because they realize the danger of asceticism in its own sake. I mean, in the case of Siddhartha, he tries asceticism, he engages in the extreme self-mortification of the ascetics of India, but then realizes that the proper course is actually to be a middle way. And in the case of Rabia, that seems to be what's happening, because she was turning against some of the ascetics because of this tendency to make asceticism the goal of the path. Right? And so Rabia is credited with introducing actually this doctrine of pure love, where she wanted to correct some of this, these extreme uh, ascetic tendencies of the, of the early Sufis. So if that comes close to answering your question, that's what I would have to say. Jeff? You, you, you refer to uh, Advait Vedanta. Uh, Rabia's love for God was it was it a monistic love or a dualistic love? This is a difficult question to answer for reasons that I explained in the beginning. Namely, how difficult it is to actually know Rabia's actual views on many different questions. Her life, because her life is steeped in legend, and sometimes the hagiographer's personality is more present in the account than Rabia's own personality, it becomes very difficult to know what her actual position was on certain, on, on such subtle philosophical questions, whether she was a non-dualist or not. And what Wider the Sakyakina did. Um, was that she took these sayings of Rabia and constructed a kind of chronology so that there was a, a development in her spirituality, a move from asceticism towards a kind of non-duality. Right? And But that uh, makes sense of much of the material, but it is somewhat speculative. So I think it, there does seem to be a non-duality present in her sayings, but um, if she was a non-dualist, then it would have been something that she developed in the later period of her spiritual maturation. Um, but to re reiterate what I said earlier, it's hard to know with any certainty uh, what Rabia's actual position was. We don't have any writings of Rabia's. Um, all we know about her, we know through other writers who re recounted stories at the same time. Thank you, Abhi. Thank you. <coughs> Enlightening us for Travi, a past woman, great lady. And my question is regarding at that time period, did she conform to the Islamic laws or the Al Shara, you call it? Did they accept her, whatever she was saying as a past lady, or did they revolted against her? And again, how you compare up to the other religions like we have Mata, Devi, the Durga, and all that energetic women? in their mythology, but still as a woman of Joan of Arc or any other history uh, depicting her as that, or she was more devoted to God as a pious woman and a devotee. Okay. Uh, it's difficult for me to come up with any comparisons with women in other traditions, no one comes to mind. But in terms of the first question, um, it, it, it was part of it was normative in the Sufi tradition for everyone to have to live a life that was in conformity to the norms of Islamic piety. So this would have meant the performance of the rituals, the five prayers, the fasting, and so on. So there's nothing to that effect that we find in Rabia's life. Everyone, there was a certain kind of conformity to the outward norms of religion in all of the ascetics, and all of the early Sufis. What we find, however, in Rabia, if anything, which did provoke some discomfort, was an extreme iconoclasm. In other words, she could not tolerate any intermediaries between her and God. So there's one story of Rabia that was told, where Rabia make, makes her way to the pilgrimage. 
on the way to making the pilgrimage, her donkey dies. She's delayed in the pilgrimage. She's tired and exhausted. What happens is that the Kaaba then, this is hagiographical, the Kaaba then comes out to greet her. Instead of her going to the Kaaba, the Kaaba itself, make itself makes its way to Rabia. And Rabia says to the Kaaba, I did not come for the Kaaba, I came for the Lord of the Kaaba. <laughs> right? The Kaaba is just a black stone. So you see this kind of extreme iconoclasm. There's another story of Rabia where they ask Rabia, oh Rabia, do you hate Satan? She says, my soul is so consumed with the love of God that I have no room for the hate of God. <laughs> but that's not the problem. There's another story of Rabia where the Prophet Muhammad appears to her in a dream. And he says to Rabia, oh Rabia, do you love me? The Prophet asks Rabia, oh Rabia, do you love me? She says, oh Prophet of God, who is there that doesn't love you? From the community of the Prophet. But my heart is so consumed with the love of God that there's no room for the love of another. So that's a kind of iconoclasm. That she couldn't accept any intermediary between her own personal relationship with God. And so some of those sayings then became problematic for the more clerical establishment. As well as her very open criticism of those who sought paradise. Or she saw it as a very low spiritual ambition. And so you'll find certain clerics saying that how can you be critical of this desire for paradise when scripture is replete with descriptions of paradise. And so Rabia herself, only, she, didn't see, she didn't see that there was anything wrong with it. She felt that it was a spiritual imperfection, that, you, that your aspiration should be higher than paradise. Sure, the common believer seeks paradise and there's nothing wrong with it. But if you are a real lover of God, then you should, as Bishop Jean-Pierre said, you should prefer the God of paradise. You should prefer the God of paradise to God's paradise. So that's where you get some of the tensions with the clinical establishment. But in terms of her outward conformity to Islam, there's no question that she was outwardly a very pious woman, very scrupulous in her observant of the rights and the rituals of the laws of Islam. Thank you. I'm going to interrupt you. So you're a Muslim man. What would a Muslim woman take from Rabia's life in living today in North America? I think that's a, maybe a question to ask a Muslim woman. Uh, would you present it? Um, I mean, I think, for me personally, I think, um, like I said, I can't speak about what a Muslim woman would take. Um, I think there's a message there that really transcends gender. Um, that she's an inspiration. I mean, this doctrine of the pure love of God, it doesn't matter what your gender is. Um, it's a beautiful doctrine. And, you know, initially, when I read Rabia's aphorisms, I thought, you know, she's putting these men in their places all the time. And I thought this is like a particular gender dynamic, and this is what's being highlighted. But then later on, as I read more of these Sufi accounts, I realized, as I pointed out in the lecture, that it's really just part of a genre of Sufi literature where the powerless speak a word of truth to those in power. And there's a saying of Muhammad where he says that the, the greatest act of jihad is actually a word of truth in the presence of a tyrant. Mm -hmm. that the greatest act of jihad is a word of truth in the presence of a tyrant. And so you get a kind of lesser embodiment of that in this, the history of Sufism where the saints who have no power would speak a word of truth to someone in power. And so I think in Rabia's case, you know, there's more going on than simply a gender dynamic. And there's more a power dynamic that she's, that she's, uh, that she's embodying. So uh, that's what I would say. Shiv? Yeah. The reason I uh, got up was uh, in uh, reference to the question that Mr. Kohli asked, is there a parallel from Rabia's life and from the life of Mira? I see total parallel. Uh, Mira, very from childhood, she was devoted. Mira was an Indian woman uh, from Rajasthan. From very early childhood, she was devoted. Yes. 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 And uh, she was uh, not from a poor family. That was the only difference. She was from a royal family, married to a prince, and 
मेरे तो गिरधर गोपाल और दूसरा सिंगल माइंडेड डिवोशन सिंगल माइंडेड डिवोशन वेन यू आर देयर यू आर नॉट वर्ड वेदर यू आर लिविंग योर लाइफ इन इन अकॉर्डेंस विद द एक्सेप्टेड नॉर्म्स और नॉट यू आर नॉट वर्ड अबाउट द नॉर्म्स ऑफ द सोसाइटी or the doctrine of the religion you have transcended that so whether rabia lived in accordance with the sharia or not for her she has gone beyond sharia she has gone beyond tariqa she's gone to al haq so there is no I I actually am Muslim I I'm not sure what I identify with I'm not sure if I'm Muslim or Sufi or Sunni or not um I don't see any conflict uh, between what uh, Rabia uh, was uh, practicing in her life because as a as a Muslim my understanding of Islam is that it is a direct relation there is no focus on clerics or any other human uh, the relationship is direct and shiv sharia is a man made thing it's it's not a, a, a it's not related to god am i correct that's the question can we keep it to questions folks i know it's very encouraging to kind of uh, but we keep it to questions okay no, but, 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 but the question but the question you could ask is are you correct that was the question Well, just to comment on what Sheriff had said and what you yourself had said, uh, I think definitely when you read the writings of the great spiritual masters of the religions, it doesn't matter which tradition you're talking about, the religious rites and the rituals are simply a means to an end. They're never meant to become an end in, in and of themselves. And there's a certain element of iconoclasm in all of the great mystics of the world. Don't take the means to be an end. And that's the problem with fundamentalism. because religious fundamentalism tends to make the means an end it becomes obsessed with the forms the symbols right the externalities of religion whereas what we learn from the mystics of all the religions is that um don't take them to be ends in and of themselves but most of them to from my own reading of the history of mysticism most of them have obtained or reached the end through the means so even though the means is not to be confused with the end the means are necessary in order to reach the end no, no. and so like mira we mentioned i don't know i haven't studied life of mira but i'm sure that if you study her life you'll find that her practice was quite infused with hindu rites and rituals and so on but it was simply a means to the person was is not wonderful yes that is just wonderful like a church it's a means to an end we're still but anyhow this is just that last year we put up that uh, mountain Of philosophy, and that's the means to end. And one thing I remember you saying is, you're climbing the mountain. Don't be looking over the other things and saying how they're doing, and, and jump over here. You'll never make it to the top. Um, yeah. I'm speaking for her. It's her quest. She says Rabia was a Sufi poet. Do you think you can sing one of her poem, any of her poem? You don't have to be a singer. With the camera on, you have to pull teeth out. <laughs> that's my job. You got With the camera head. off, you still have to pull teeth out. <laughs> sorry, 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 that's like. It's okay. Um, no, she is. I, I have. I don't know her poetry. No. I don't know her poetry. I don't um, think she was a poet. There, well, there are she poems. Was a poet. There are poems ascribed to her. There are, there are some. And you can find them on YouTube. Yeah, no, there are poems. Any other question, folks? Uh, Vicky? Oh. Vicky. Vicky. Next time. Any other questions? Wow. Anyhow, Atif, you are always just just wonderful to have you here. Um, and thank you so much on behalf of us all and I turn this over to Vicky to um to do a little presentation come on over here come 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 this way oh, oh. Uh, oh,
<laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Um, so on behalf of, of Shin and Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, uh, one, the, the beauty you see is the beauty of your own soul. So uh, you know, I appreciate the gratitude. Uh, like, the beauty of your own soul. I feel like this community is becoming like a family now because you know when I came here four years ago, unfamiliar faces, but now I seem you know I know all the faces are recognizable. So this is kind of a nice development. That we have this annual function where we all gather together to share our knowledge with each other. Thank you very much once again for your invitation.